with Hughes Private Capital for the last 11 years. Uh, we started in the downturn, so we've seen quite the cycle as we've gone through all of this sort of stuff. Um, we are based out of Reno, Nevada, but we do most all of our buying and everything in the Midwest, which we'll talk about tonight. Um, I was uh, born and raised here, uh, been married for the last, uh, let's see, I got I better calculate this out the right way. It'll be 32 years this year um, and, and have four kids. So um, I always kind of like to give you that introduction, give you a feel. Um, I, I think we got a picture of the family here. So uh, all of the four kids are growing at this point. Um, my oldest son, who's there in the red, Hayden, is in the Air Force, and he's based in Japan. And so fortunately, the whole family was able to go to Japan this year and uh, visit him and his wife, Taylor, who's in front of him. And uh, you can see I'm kind of on the far right there next to Will. Will is my daughter's boyfriend, and my daughter's in the middle there in the white shirt. She's my oldest. She runs the marketing department for our company. And then uh, the tall guy right in the middle is Dexter. He's my youngest, uh, next to my wife, Tanya. And then my middle son, Tate, with the sunglasses on the far left. Um, so that was really a lot of fun. We got to go there with the whole family and everything. But that gives you just a little bit of background on myself and um, where we're coming from. So we've got about 65 employees that work for the company in, in and around about 40 or 45 of them are based here in Reno. The rest of them are based in the Midwest. Um, so uh, we have the boots on the ground, which, which again, we'll talk about all that. So, all right, well, that's probably enough about me and the company. Uh, let's just jump right into this. I know we're gonna focus mostly on 1031 exchanges tonight, but I'm gonna give you a, a basic overview so that everybody can see and um, understand exactly what we do. And then we'll tell you about a couple different ways that you can invest and we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time on the 1031 at the end, okay? So what we do is we buy affordable homes in the Midwest. Now we're buying them in five cities in three states. So the five cities that we buy them in are the three that are in Ohio are Cleveland, Akron, and um, Toledo. And then we also buy in St. Louis and we buy in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. So what that does is it gives us a, a tremendous amount of diversification within our portfolio to um, what I always kind of like to think of it as is a safety net. You know, we throw a safety net out there because we've got all these properties in many different places. And at this point, when we're recording this, this, this webinar here today, um, we just hit about 875 homes. So I always have to say about because we're, we're, adding um, about 40 to 50 homes per month to the overall portfolio. Now, these homes are, are the affordable homes. So that means they, they range in somewhere around 85,000, maybe 100,000, might get up to $125,000 or so, but they're the affordable homes, making them very affordable for the tenants that are out there. Now we do this on purpose because being in that part of the market always gives us, again, some additional safety, lowering the risk for us. Because as they say, people always need a place to live. When the economy goes down at any time, um, those people are not going to be leaving those homes. And in fact, if anything, we could even get busier with higher occupancy because people don't upsize, they downsize when, they, when, when things go, you know, when things get tough that are out there. Um, so um, we're in those, those five cities, the three states, giving us a lot of diversification with these affordable homes out there. Um, and and um, we're gonna continue to build this up and have uh, even greater sustainability as we continue to do this. Now, one of the things that we've found that is what we really consider to be the difference between success and failure is that in each one of our cities, we have our own real estate brokerage, our own property management, and our own construction management. And um, why I say that that's the difference between success and failure is because when you're relying on a third party, say a third party property manager, it's a lot tougher to be really successful with what you're doing out there. So those 20 people that are employees out there that are part of all these, these parts of divisions of our, our company, 
have really made the difference for us um, in, in the way that we operate and do that. We'll enter into probably new cities over time, but it'll only be when we add our own real estate brokerage, property management, and construction management um, that is out there. All right, so the other thing that we're doing all the time is that we're looking towards cash flow. We're not looking for the appreciation. These homes don't fluctuate up and down in value. So the play here is not some big appreciation, uh, something that we might experience here in Reno, Nevada, but you're not gonna experience it with these homes in the Midwest. Um, and, but that's to our advantage as well. So we're not gonna have big swings one way or another. It's not super important to how we're timing of the market when we're buying it. And that gives us additional safety of just having the cash flow with that. Now we will get some appreciation, but most of the part, these homes appreciate maybe one, maybe two, maybe 3% a year um, overall. So that gives you an idea of what we're looking at for what we, what we um, have out there, what we're managing in the portfolio and everything like that. So what I think we should probably jump into is just giving you a couple ideas on how you can participate. And we're gonna leave the 1031 actually till the end here um, because it's probably, um, well, since we're doing this more 1031 focus, we'll get through the other ones quickly here and then, and then spend a little bit more time on the 1031. So one of the ways that you can participate and be an investor with us is you can do it through our fund. So we own a fund and the fund is part of that 875 homes uh, portfolio out there. Uh, the fund is, is producing around about eight and a half percent return as of today. And then and if you're in the fund, you'll also get the depreciation at the end of the year. So that will add to your return, maybe one to one and a half percent. Uh, for, for your overall return. So you might get that up to nine and a half percent, let's just call it for that. Very easy, that's a great way to go in if you're doing it with IRAs, if you're doing it with a 401k, any way of, uh, do, or if you're doing those, that's a great way to go in and just do it in the fund, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, the, uh, the, the, the fund itself um, has been around for about three and a half years now. Um, like I said, we've been around for about 11 years. We've been doing real estate for that entire time. But this is, this is our fourth fund uh, that has been um, out there for investors out in the public to, to be part of. And to own. When you're collecting your money out of the fund, what you're doing is you own your own pro rata share of that. So in other words, the net profits at the end of uh, the month is what you get to collect on that. And that's how you're getting your so that one's easy, it's straightforward, and um, one of the options that you have. So now let's talk about the other. It's called a secured portfolio. So in this case, we own X amount of homes in the fund. So as of today, we're sitting on, well, overall the portfolio is worth about $60 million. So that's basically the assets that are under management. Inside of that, the fund owns about 10 or $15 million worth of homes that are sitting in our inventory that can be actually sold to you as a secured portfolio. So if you were to do that, this is the way that that would work. You would come in and you would buy um, a home or homes, most of the time it's homes, um, and we would lease those homes back from you and we would pay you a set monthly income on that. And then those homes, let's just call it five for this example, that you're gonna, you're gonna have five homes. We're gonna, we're gonna lease those five homes back, pay you a set monthly income, and then we're gonna take over all the responsibilities for those. And those homes are gonna go back into our portfolio. So that's the way we look at it. You're getting paid off how the portfolio performs itself. Um, and your only expense that you're gonna have is the owner's insurance. So that's the only expense that comes out of your pocket. And even with that, we'll help you to get put up on our full policy for the insurance and even pay it for you but it is your only expense. So what does that mean? Well, let's say the hot water heater breaks on one of your homes. We go out, we fix it, and we pay for it. Let's say a home of yours is vacant. Doesn't matter. You still get paid your set monthly income. Now, how can we do that? We do that again because your homes go back into the portfolio, even though your name's on the title, and it's, you're paid for that, from that whole portfolio. So you can see how that gives you all the safety that you need and diversification as compared to just owning 
one home, two homes, five homes, even 10 homes, et cetera, right? Um, and that, that's a great way to go, giving you no landlord hassles whatsoever um, on any of that. So now why would you want to do that? Why would you want to come in as compared to being in the fund and, and instead buy homes? Well, there's really two reasons for that. Reason number one is you can finance them. So we can help you to go out, get to with our preferred lender. Um, you can do up to 10 mortgages in your name and they call them the golden mortgages because they're the beautiful uh, 30 year Fannie Mae 4% loans that are out there. And if you were to do that, you can double your return. So you're gonna be making somewhere between 14 to 16% on your money if you were to finance these homes and, um, and, and have your name on the title and then just have us lease them back from you. So for those people that are willing to do that, kind of go through that little bit of extra work, getting your financing done, because once it's done, you've got a great loan for a long time, um, that, that's a great way to go because you can really increase your return. The second reason that you'd want to come in and do a secured portfolio is, again, more the focus of what we wanted to talk about is doing a 1031 exchange. So when you do a 1031 exchange, you would sell off your investment property, and then um, that money has to go into a 1031 exchange account. Now, we tell everybody this because it's so important, um, especially if you haven't done one, you can never take the possession of the money from your sale of the property that you've sold, okay? So in other words, it has to go into a 1031 account. If you take possession of that money and then want to do a 1031 account, we can't help you on that one. That one, unfortunately, you're just stuck. You're not going to be able to do a 1031. Okay. So that's a really important part of that. So the way that this would work, you sell one of your investment properties um, and or both or multiples, whatever on that. Um, and you come in, you have X amount of dollars, let's say in your 1031 account. So let's, let's just do it that you're going to have $500,000 in your 1031 account. And on average, our home's gonna be around $100,000. Um, so you come in, you buy then five homes, and it all works exactly the same way. Those five homes are titled in your name because that's what is gonna meet the 1031 requir requirement for you. And then we're going to uh, lease those homes back from you, pay you a set monthly income, and um, put those homes back into the portfolio but your name does stay on the title. And all that works again the same way. We take all the responsibility. You, your only expense is the owner's insurance and, and that's it. So it really is pretty simple when you move forward um, to do that. Now, 1031s have certain types of rules. In other words, you have to identify your properties within 45 days. You have to close within 180 days. Um, all those things are very easily met with us. Um, because uh, we, we already have those homes in inventory and can make that happen. Now, the one other thing that you can do with your, with your 1031 is we were using the example that you own the property free and clear. So you got $500,000 in um, and that was just all cash. Um, we can do a 1031 exactly that way. That's fine. Or you can go out and get outside financing as well, just like what we talked about. Now, depending on the number of mortgages that you have available that you can actually get, you can also get another 10 with your spouse if your spouse qualifies. So you could theoretically have 20 um, less whatever you already have as, as a mortgage. But there again, what you're going to do is you're going to drive your return up probably in, well, 1031s get a little bit more complicated, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say you're going to drive that return back up to maybe 12 to 16% or so. Um, and we can help you with all of that, working you through the process, um, making that happen, and um, we make it as easy as possible um, because this is very much a passive investment. And what we found for most people that are doing 1031s is that they've sort of been there, done that. In other words, They've owned that property for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and they're, they're at that point in their life, they're like, okay, good, I did it. I own real estate, I love real estate, but I wanna get rid of these landlord hassles. 
I, but, and I don't want to pay any taxes. So I like doing a 1031 and they come to us so that they can go into some other real estate investment, not paying any taxes through there and um, having no landlord assets. Now, one last thing I'll say, and then we'll, we'll, we'll open this up for some questions um, for you guys. You'll notice in our marketing materials, we'll talk about doubling your income through a 1031. And this is, I don't know, I guess I just always have to say amazing, although I've seen it just time after time after time. So maybe it, it shouldn't be so amazing to me anymore. But, but really what happens is people buy, buy pieces of property and they usually leverage them, right? They take out a little debt, they do some financing, and they do that. Well, you're always making a better return with that. Well, over time, you pay that off uh, or pay it down, and you have what we call trapped equity with inside of those properties. So when you look at that and you come to do a deal with us, is what happens is instead of that equity being trapped and you're not working as hard as it should for you, we're able to kind of release that trapped equity, get it all working 100% for you again. And that's where we find when you really look at what you're netting on your properties today, it's really, really rare that we don't double or more your income when you come talk to us. Um, we actually just talked to somebody today that um, interestingly enough, we were gonna be paying around 36,000 net when we looked at the numbers and he was making somewhere around, I don't know, maybe about 45,000. Very unusual that it didn't, um, but he also admitted to us that it was one of his office buildings that he was renting to himself. So he was actually kind of overpaying on the lease um, because it was a benefit to him. So anyways, that's, that, that's kind of a, a good overview. I know we always have a few questions, Ashley. Um, so why don't we uh, jump into that and uh, answer whatever we can. Sounds good. So if you'd like to submit some questions, you can use the Q&A tool that you should see at the bottom of your screen. It's a little button that actually says Q&A and it has little speech bubbles. Um, and those questions just come to us. No one else can see those, so you can submit anonymously. And we're going to have those open for a few minutes, so feel free to submit your questions. And it looks like we have one here. Um, is it safe to take on debt right now to invest it? And could that debt become a problem during a recession? Um, I love this question um, because to me, this is always the good debt, bad debt question. Um, so what, what is that, right? So what, what, what's bad debt? Well, let's start there. Bad debt is when I take on some type of debt that is not income producing. Um, so I refi my house, I take money out, I buy myself an RV, a ski boat, and go on a nice vacation. Um, that's bad debt. Um, and not necessarily if you can afford it and you can do all that and you want to do that, that's fine. But it's not the way if you want, because the question is, are you going to get in trouble, right? If a recession comes, what's, what's going to happen? Good debt, on the other hand, could be the same thing. If I refied my house, pulled money out of it, but I invested it in something like what we're talking about here tonight that has cash flow, that's good debt. Because if I can, if I can get my debt at a lower rate than what I'm making, so in this case, let's just talk about where we are kind of today. If I can, if I can make a, or pay 4% on my interest and I can, and I can make on an all cash deal 8%, which when then is leverage, will get me upwards to 12%, maybe even 16%. That's good debt. That's, that's where you want to be. Is that going to get you in trouble with a recession? Well, again, I can really only speak to our investment because there is obviously, you could go take debt thinking you're going to put it into something good, um, but it's more speculative. And even though it might have cash flow or not very much, you know, you think you might be okay. Um, with ours, the deal is, again, we're doing just cash flow. So it really puts you in a safe place. You got to look at what the product is, what the asset's going to be, what's backing that up, how are you making the money. Um, if you were to do this in Reno today, Reno is in a fantastic market right now. But I wouldn't buy anything here um, because we also got hit during the downturn. So, you know, we saw property values drop um, 40, 50, 60%. Well, 
what happens is if you were to go buy a rental here in Reno, you can't get positive cash flow. It's very difficult today unless you've owned the property for a long period of time. It's really hard to leverage it with debt and to get positive cash flow. That's why if you're doing something like with us in the Midwest, that's all we have is cash flow. I mean, it, it, the, the, the appreciation side of it is just the old cherry on top type of a deal. But if we never got any appreciation, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, because all we are worried about is the cash flow that's coming through. So you just got to be smart about it. Know that even if, 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 and in our case, if the economy goes down, I think we could even be stronger with these types of assets just because they're the most affordable homes. So I know that's kind of a long answer, but I, I always like that question because I, I think it's a really smart deal. And there's so many of us have been taught that debt's bad. And yet it's not, it just has to be used the right way, you know, and use smart, so. All right, we have another question. If I have rental properties in Reno, why would the income from lease payments exceed what the rental properties currently produce? Hmm, I'm not sure, sure I 100% I understand that. Can you read it for me again? Sure. And um, who, the person who submitted this question, if you have any clarification, feel free to send it over and I'll relay that to Greg. So the question is, if I have rental properties in Reno, mm -hmm. why would the income from lease payments exceed what the rental properties currently produce? I'm sorry. I, I don't really understand what, I think I might know what, what they're asking if you have rentals in Reno, um, if you were to compare that to the rentals in the Midwest, but, so I, I'm going to try to answer this from this perspective, okay? Um, if, if I owned a $400,000 home in Reno, I might get $2,000 worth of rent. Is that, that, there's a rent ratio there to the value of the home. So if you looked at $2,000 on $400,000, that's a half a percent. It's a half of 1%, okay? So, but if I took that same property, or not same property, but basically the same level of property, okay? I might have a $100,000 property in the Midwest, but I, I might be making $1,200 or $1,100 on that property. So there my rent ratio has gone even above 1%. So I've more than doubled my rent ratio in comparison to the two. And that, that's why we buy in, in the Midwest. And I mean, I would love to be able to buy in Reno where I live and uh, make things a lot easier um, from that perspective. So hopefully I'm answering what they're, what they're asking there um, on that. But that, that, that's why we do that. Um, it's hard. You've got to go. We've, we've researched city after city after city, and we look at the demographics but we're looking at a mathematical formula based on what can we buy it for? What can we rehab it for? And what can we rent it for? And then of course we take into consideration all the expenses that come along with that. And that's going to give us some type of a return. And when you do those returns, again, here's what you're gonna get in Reno. You're gonna get appreciation, but you just, you're gambling. You just don't know, right? One is it when, when did you buy it? And then two is when do you sell it? So that is, you're going to get much more appreciation in Reno than as compared to the Midwest. Midwest is boring, you know. Um, it just is, they don't fluctuate. There's not a lot of appreciation. But we have these high rent ratios and yields that help us to have that cash flow. So hopefully I'm answering that question the right way um, of what they're asking. And I'll just note that in a few minutes here, we're going to put up our information for how you can get in touch with the team. Sometimes these questions are better answered in a one-on-one -on -one setting where we can really go into more depth with your uh, situation um, or your specific questions. Um, we do have one more question um, and we're getting kind of close to our time here, but we should have time to answer this one. So why would someone invest in the fund over the secured portfolio or vice versa? Well, mainly you're going to go into the fund if you're going to use your IRA or 401k, okay? Um, and then I would say the other time that you're going to go into the fund, because it's just easier, is if you're going to use cash, that's fine, great. You're going to get your 
and that's terrific. We have a lot of people that do that. But um, where, where you would then want to go to the secured portfolio is if you want to do finance. So if you're willing to go do financing, you can be in basically the same type of portfolio. You go through the hassle of getting the financing done, but it's done then, and you're, and you're, you're set. Um, and at that point, you're going to double your return. So, um, or at least most of the time you are. Uh, so those are the reasons that you're going to go in one or the other. The last is, is if you're going to do a 1031, you don't have the option to go into the fund. And the reason for that is, is whatever your property that you sold, um, if whatever the name is on there, is the name that has to go on to the property titles of the ones you buy in the exchange. And that's the way that you meet the requirements for the 1031. Um, and you can't do that if you go into the fund because your name doesn't go on the title of any certain properties from that. Um, one thing we didn't cover, and I'll just mention here briefly, is when you're ready to get out of the fund, we will buy the property, I'm sorry, not out of the fund, out of the secured portfolio, when you have your name on the titles, um, we'll buy those properties back from you. And, and again, I can give you more detail on that um, and how that exactly works. But what we're doing with everybody is making it as easy as possible. We want it to put all of the performance issues onto us so that nobody has that problem that's out there. And, and that's where we will put a bottom to what our buyback is. And that bottom is, is that whatever we sold you the property for, we'll always buy it back from you at that same original price. So that helps people to know that they can always get their principal back um, in, in uh, that type of investment. All right, well, we are just about at our time for today. So do you have any final thoughts or anything that you'd like to share? I think really, Ashley, just what you had mentioned before. So if you, um, you know, have other questions, you wanna make a time, we can put a call together, a Zoom call, um, a, you know, love to meet in person if you're around and you feel comfortable enough doing that. Um, so just get in touch with us. We'll throw up all of our um, uh, contact information here on the screen and, um, and, and we'll take it from there. So um, I know this doesn't ever get through all the questions that everybody has, but um, it gives you a, probably a, a good overview. So we look forward to talking to you and thanks, thanks for joining us tonight. Okay, thanks. All right, so that is our time for today. And like Greg just mentioned, um, it's we're, our team is excited to hear from you. So you can go ahead and submit your contact information to us via the Q&A tool. Uh, that information just comes to me. So if there's a preferred way that you'd like us to reach out to you, uh, just let us know that way. And my colleague is going to put up a screen here in just a second that shows our team contact information and including our email address and our phone number, and we'll get in touch with you soon. But thank you so much for joining us tonight and have a great rest of your day.